start with today is the article that I, uh, I handed out in the last class by the professor here, the philosophy professor Richard Cox. Um, and a few people came and talked to me about this, or mentioned it, or um, I'm going to embarrass Brian now. Um, Brian sent me this email, so, <laughs> um, which was from him and Aaron. And what Brian was saying was that this article, this is an argument that computers will never be conscious. And as Brian has states in here that um, he just. He never discusses bottom-up approaches, the idea of neural networks, anything like that, to Richard Cox computers are very rule-based. Everything is zeros, ones, and rules. Um, he speaks about creating emergence into novelty. Um, do you want to talk to this, Brian? I think Aaron should probably talk to Aaron. about this. I mean, you bring in the metric um, evolution, obviously, the yeah, that was, idea. Yeah, that was kind of like, you're reading it, and there's like these little problems, and then he's made this bold claim that creativity can't, basically requires an, uh, an already existent intelligence that's like a top-down in order to create anything, and uh, biological evolution shows that complex things can come from very simple interactions over a long period of time, over <clears throat> thousands and millions of permutations. Um, and mimetic evolution is the same idea, only with <coughs> ideas and snippets of information that can be transmitted uh, differentially, reproduced differentially, and combined in different ways that are either useful or not, or either have a greater transmission advantage or don't. So it's very analogous to genetic evolution, and it's a bottom-up approach to what we call creativity. Um, yeah. So it's just... It's a very controversial article. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that's an understatement, though. <laughs> Probably written to provoke. To provoke, yeah. And, and you say here, the shock value associated with the article is definitely there. Did anyone else read this one since last week? No one else read it? Well, um, we're going to start off today with a bit of discussion of this one, and then we'll go back and we'll let you guys ask us questions from your groups. Anything you want to finish or uh, talk to with us. Um, so, the article, uh, it starts with a, a kind of standard trope that anyone um, discussing artificial intelligence starts with. You usually either start with HAL from 2001 or data from Star Trek. You know, it, it's a kind of standard thing to talk about with AI. And this, this one is data from Star Trek. But, um, and he then begins what does it mean to be human? Is data from Star Trek can't be classed as human? Um, I find it. I find it amusing to imagine the horror of an evil scientist hoping to take over the world with a super smart computer, only to discover that the computer is intensely moral. Which is a, and that's a nice phrase, <laughs> actually. I, I kind of yeah. like that idea, this idea of moral computers. Um, now, he's very, very critical of Kurtzville. Um, if Kurtzville suddenly grew horns on camera, I wouldn't necessarily suspect special effects. So, you know, he has a very negative view of Kurtzville. And he then begins to talk about Daniel Dennett, the philosopher who came up with the zombie paradox, changing one neuron at a time. And he says, Daniel Dennett, speaking of people with horns. So, you know, he thinks a lot of people are the devil, it seems. Um, now, I was not, I want robots. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> See, there's a positive thing. Uh, I said I like <laughs> <laughs> um, One of the things that we're thinking about here is that these are 
these are a little bit, these arguments are surprising, not from a rhetorical point of view, but, but from a philosophical point of view. Because any logician would call these arguments ad hominem arguments. They're not arguments against the uh, position that Kurzweil holds. They're arguments about the perceived character of Dennett and Kurzweil. What, what kind of argument did you call it? They're called an argument against the man. So okay. instead of actually, it's a, it's a logical fallacy. Mm. If, you, if I say uh, Freud smoked cigars, so obviously anything he says can't be, we can't count on. Right. Well, no, that's not, that's not true. Just because you sus suspect someone is in the league with the devil, doesn't mean that their arguments are valid or invalid, correct or incorrect, true or false. So it's, it's a little bit disturbing uh, in, in a way to see an article that uh, is asserting itself as a philosophical discussion uh, relying so heavily on uh, ad hominem. Kind of ad, ad hominem in Latin means against the man. So like a character assassination. Right. Yeah. It is. It's a, it's a character assassination is an example of that. So it's, if, you, if you, you, you dismiss the, the person rather than the person's arguments. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a logical fallacy. <coughs> What if, some, what, if, what if the person, like in this case Heidegger, he made a lot of arguments about, you know, like the nature of the human beings, but he was a Nazi. Doesn't his relation with the Nazi party sort of undermine his arguments considering what they stood for? His relationship with the Nazi party is controversial. <coughs> Why he did have a relationship with them and all of that. Um, so you could do a kind of more careful analysis and actually what was involved for him in that affiliation. Um, but uh, uh, I, I do want to say that there is a place where the facts of a person's life are, may, may be relevant. You have to make the argument that, that those positions are relevant. You just simply can't dismiss the person out of hand. Uh, is that, so I, so uh, but usually, usually any appeal to any dismissal of a person based on the facts of their lives, uh, a person's, is, is a, a logical fallacy. It, you have to address the premises and the, uh, and the conclusions, the inferences in the argument that is the same. Is that making sense to you? Yeah. So, um, so I don't want to say it's, the biographical facts are never relevant. They often are. But it's how you deploy them. So um, I love this uh, paragraph that when uh, He's thinking about the sentence, in the paraphrase there, to paraphrase uh, Weizenbaum, well, to paraphrase Weizenbaum says that to imagine that we can build a conscious humanoid robot is in effect to say, I understand human beings so well I can build one myself. So his, look at what he says here. My response was to think how true, right? I mean, and to make a point of remembering it. So when I started to talk about this with my wife, Anna, who I dearly like, Richard and Anna are friends of mine, so uh, I, I'm not trying to turn out hominem for out hominem here. But there's an interesting thing to see. Uh, he, he, he has this, what I like to call the test of an argument. Uh, will, it meet, will it meet the approval of your wife at breakfast test? <laughs> um, he says, oh, I mentioned this to Anna, and she says, well, right, that it sounds really good. When I started to talk about this with my wife, Anna, the following morning, she made exactly the same comment before I had a chance to repeat Weizenbaum's wisdom. I was most impressed, although Anna said I shouldn't be. So this is nice, and you know, it sort of creates a, a domestic scene. Well, what's the, what's the argument here? I understand human beings so well I can build one myself. Well, what's the question <coughs> we're actually pursuing here? Um, does it require us to understand human beings in order to build a model of human being? Does it? No, right? It's, it's in the building of the models that we come to understand human beings uh, with, greater, with greater depth and precision and exactitude. So it's not like I have to have this finished or completed knowledge about human beings in order to create a perfect replica or a perfect uh, model of one that will then become conscious and then be intelligent. So there's a lot of confusion in the argument as it's unfolding because he's taking this kind of casual approach to these questions. Um, and, that, and there's more to say about that, but can you see the flaw in the reasoning there? I'm not sure I'm, I'm saying it very well. I, but right, if we heard somebody say, I understand human beings so well I can build them myself, like, we'd see that as hubris. We'd see that because nobody understands human beings uh, in, in so well. How could we create one? Well, I think that's a flawed argument. Right? Is that, is that making some sense? I, I, I think we can create 
models. Uh, it, it, there's an argument to be made that human beings create other human beings all the time. It's called procreation. Um, <laughs> and when did parents ever understand their children? Or, or when did children ever understand their parents? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so those, those would be kinds of, uh, uh, kinds of things I'd explore if I was in a conversation. We might invite you to come to class. You might, yeah, you might be interested. Uh, you might join us if he's free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few other things. If you, there's a, if we, you have more to say? I'll yeah, I was going to, there's a few paragraphs to go that I won't have to talk about. Um, he, he makes this very, in some way, I find this one a little bit more difficult than the previous one. Uh, he talks about another one of Weizenbaum's comments. This is from a documentary he was watching when he quoted Daniel, the philosopher Daniel Dennett. And again, he doesn't like Daniel Dennett, but said, Daniel Dennett said, we must lose our reverence for life before any real progress can be made in AI. Now that's a difficult phrase um, and hard to understand. Um, or to, to justify as well this reverence for life. Now, Richard takes this in a kind of way of saying, well, that's like Hitler, who didn't have any reverence for life, but at least he had reverence for her in life. You know, this is worse because there's no reverence. Um, and I just, I felt that this was kind of out of context. That's not what this was saying. <laughs> Yeah. It was talking about this kind of human chauvinism we have, this specialness. And are we really that special? This idea that a computer could never play chess because chess is a special human activity, then we prove it can. Which means that it's not that special. So I thought of it more in that way than in the way he seems to take it here. And I find this, you know, and he, and he admits that doing this with Hitler the refuge of a scandal. It's a kind of, it's an academic trick, you know. <laughs> look, look at the, they throw that one at Obama as well. You know, it's, like it, it's a common. It's just an it's, it's the worst thing you can say. Yeah. It's an extension of an odd hominem argument, right? Mm. Uh, then it talks like Hitler, therefore then it is Hitler. But uh, then it is worse because Hitler had some reference. But you're absolutely right that the statement that Dennett is making. I believe it's taken out of context. I don't. I don't know the specific mm. uh, place where it occurs. But uh, <coughs> why, why would Dennett say such a thing? We must lose our reverence for life uh, because reverence for life, in, in, as it's traditionally understood, is uh, keeping human beings at the center, imagining human beings as special, uh, uh, imagining rationality as something uh, uh, that we can uh, never fully see into. All of these things belong to a, a, a discourse that, that uh, is threatened by computer science and machine learning and uh, AI. So we, we understand where the discourse is coming from. But it's this phrase, rep, losing reverence for life, um, requires that what, 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 is it we, what is it that Dennis actually asking us to do? He's asking us to change our preconceptions. To be, to be willing to challenge our preconceptions about the nature of life, and, and to be willing to challenge our preconceptions about what we mean by reverence. An argument could be made, of course, that we are more reverent by thinking about life carefully and following where our thoughts and our experiments and where our technologies take us than by not uh, following out the best things that our own intelligence teaches us. It, it, it seems to me there's something fundamentally inhuman about requiring people uh, not to follow up on the thoughts that they have. Um, and, and so the argument, religious arguments often say, oh, you can't think that. If you think that, you're in league with the devil. Right? But if your own <coughs> is leading you to, to, to think something through, well, then I, I think in good conscience, if one's being intellectually honest, one has an obligation to follow through. On, on, on the insights that we have and on the technologies that we're capable of exploring. There are places where larger ethical questions come into play, but not, not at this level of the analysis. Is that making some sense? The, the, there's an insight that's behind this that really is the, one of the insights that makes uh, Friedrich Nietzsche 
a really important philosopher. Nietzsche observed this, and this is the thought that lies behind Nietzsche saying that God is dead. Okay? What Nietzsche noticed is that um, inside of traditional Christian morality, so if you're raised inside of some kind of traditional, a Judeo-Christian, let's say, morality in the, in the West, when we're, when we're young, we're being taught and instructed in some of the standard virtues. Among these standard virtues is honesty. Okay? So if one is honest, one eventually comes to the realization that these stories, these myths, these sacred uh, uh, traditions that, that religions hold are based on certain uh, errors. Okay? And so what happens is Christianity carries within itself, Nietzsche argues, the seeds of its own destruction because it cultivates this virtue of honesty. If you're honest, Nietzsche, Nietzsche demonstrates, then you eventually will come to the conclusion that gods are the products of human artistic work and, and uh, they're not the, uh, the product of, of the gods or of God. They're, 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 there are no divine beings. Does that make some sense? So it's a beautiful moment in Richard's essay that's, that's kind of touching on uh, um, uh, and, and not, not acknowledging that there's really a strong uh, tension here between um, honesty, intellectual honesty, and reverence. What, what, what he's, uh, the word that he's zeroing in on there is reverence. Yeah. Yeah, I wish you'd been able to find the actual quote. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You've got to talk. He, I, oh. Not to, I don't want to sound, you know, like I'm kind of putting this down. But I mean, I would have liked to see the actual quote, know well, where it came from, see the we context. Should, we should bear in mind, this is an essay in an online magazine. It's not an academic peer-reviewed journal paper. So we shouldn't, it, it's like a blog. So we're, yeah. we're, we're putting it under some scrutiny, but you've got to remember what it is as well. So, <clears throat> um, there was one, I didn't comment on this before I go on to the next thing here, which, which interested me. Um, I was going to ask Patrick to explain this one. Yeah. <clears throat> he said, he talks about the idea of that Deverence must advocate that he doesn't have any reverence for his own life too, which I felt was going, again, this is going a bit too far, taking, I don't think that's what was meant by it, but in which case murdering Dennett would be harmless in Dennett's spirit, so we can't even call him egocentric. So, in other words, he's below the moral level of even a baby or a psychopath. Comparing babies and psychopaths may seem strange, but it's not if you know anything about moral development. Why not? I, I didn't get this one. Okay. Brian seems to. Well, um, it's funny because it, it's supposed to be like children don't have moral. They actually did a recent thing with babies to see if they had a, any sort of like innate morality, and uh, the tests sort of prove that they have a sense of fairness and justice and mercy rather than just, you know, this one is doing bad things, go him. It's, they want to see the one that's doing bad things get punished. They used like, uh, I think there were like cat puppets and there was a uh, box, and in the box was something like shiny, like give it one. And they would do two experiments. One. You know, one of the cats is tapping on the box and the other one helps it open it and they get it out and it's, oh yay, it's a thing. And the other one, the cat's tapping on the box and the other one makes sure the box stays closed and then smacks the cat. And they sort of tried to gauge the baby's reactions to it and they all disapproved pretty much unanimously of the whole, you know, of the bad one winning. <coughs> and they showed that later on. I, I seem to remember this. Yeah. I think, I, yeah. It's, it sounds familiar. Yeah. And uh, they, they show a little bit later on, you know, when kids are like four or five. That, that's when all these sort of, you know, children can be cruel and psychotic thing comes to pass because that's when we're a little bit more selfish. But uh, I don't know. I think the argument of psychopaths and babies being similar is extremely hyperbolic. Mm. I'm you. If you want to think that fairness and morality are close to the same thing, or at least address the same issues, then humans aren't the only creatures that have fairness, that can perceive fairness either. Yeah. 
for possibly a perception of fairness. Aaron, do you want to put an evolutionary spin on it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just, just the very obvious, like, they've done the same studies with chimpanzees and bonobos, and they all show the same uh, social policing and fairness, uh, conscious uh, activities, and this is what evolutionary psych is, has a problem with the social standard, standard social science model, because the standard social science model says that babies come out knowing absolutely nothing. They're completely blank slates, typical rasa. There's nothing there. Everything that, that results from their behavior is something that they were taught by their environment or their parents or what have you. Whereas evolutionary psychology says that no, we have these same inborn uh, innate um, tendencies and we have instincts just like other animals and we're not exempt from uh, kind of the, the, the stamps of our evolutionary past. So, well, this is not really. A very, do you all know the um, famous experiment with chicks and birds, birds and aeroplanes? If you, uh, if you get a shape, something like that, if it flies one way, it's an aeroplane. If it flies the other way, it uh, can be a predator. Yeah? The, the shape can represent different things by its shadow. And if you get some newborn chicks who have never come out the eggs, have never seen their mother, if you fly one way, they don't react. If you fly the other way, and it looks like a predator, they react. That is born in them. And if tiny newborn chicks have that, we must have something. The problem is finding out what it is. That's the problem. But the stuff in there, in us. This is what Conrad Lorenz calls <coughs> releasing mechanisms, IRMs. Is this the. I don't know. I, I think uh, the, the early experiments that Lorenz did with imprinting. Imprinting, yeah. Uh, uh, Joseph Campbell uh, uses this. Uh, Tom, Tom's not here tonight. He's always one of the archetypes in Joseph Campbell's. Mm -hmm. so that's why I mentioned it. Joseph Campbell, in his book called uh, Masses of God, the first volume on primitive mythology, he wants to, to speak to this point that you're raising, David. He, he wants to suggest that what Jung called archetypes are these kinds of innate releasing mechanisms that in humans. So we, we have, if we see an image of a, of a baby, of an infant's uh, head, and, and that of like, a, like a, a seal, right? we have the same kind of emotional response to the, just these simple uh, diagrams, just mm -hmm. these simple images that suggest. So there does seem to be something about our human uh, biological or physiological processes that that, uh, that reacts in some way to these mechanisms that, that are associated with imprinting. Which brings, a, coming back to the subject we're discussing here, the nature of intelligence and creating artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. begs the question, can we create an artificial intelligence without knowing what's imprinted in humans from an evolutionary point of view? Could I speculate? Could, let me just ask the computer scientists in the room. Could, could we create uh, some kind of a program that would, that would uh, react in some kind of mode that we would call something like recognition? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what that would be exactly. Uh, to um, certain kinds of images, right? So like, like the, in other words, could, could we create a computer that would have uh, Maybe, maybe some kind of a neural net that would engage in some kind of learning process on its own over time that would do something similar to what you're describing with the, with the chip. We can build recognition processes in neural networks. They're often used for pattern recognition, but uh, facial recognition, for example, learning faces. But the process, I think we're talking about something deeper here, a kind of evolved mechanism where we have it makes me think of that at Galatea, you know, where they're teaching this neural net over and over and training it, and this neural net is missing something that is inherent in a human, because we're all born with this imprinting. Are you talking, okay, are you talking about uh, domain general versus domain specific? Like, we have a, we have a module in our brain, the fusiform face area, that is only job is to recognize faces. Mm. And are you saying, are we able to build something like that? But, or have something evolve out of AI that is that? 
the question I'm, I'm asking is, in that module within our brains, is there something in there when we're born that gives us a certain feeling towards human faces or a recognition of human faces mm -hmm. that doesn't come, as you say, through nature or nurture as we grow? Is there something innate in that already? And that's what, if, so if I was to build a pattern recognition system that recognised faces, it would be missing that. And is that important? I don't know the answer to this one. I'm just hypothesising that. Oh, uh, uh, well, sorry, Matt was oh, okay. on his own. I don't know the answer to the question, but I thought about it a lot myself. My son was born, you know, the doctor hands to the, the baby, and the first time he opened his eyes, he looks at me, I look at him, we look at each other in the eyes, and then he just closes his eyes and just went right back to right, sleep. Right you know what I mean? So it's like, all right, he looked at me, he said, all right, cool. And then went right back and just closed his eyes, you know what I mean? And then but just, and then babies, probably, when they're born, have a very short distance. They yeah, but I was born to 18 inches. Yeah, yeah, I'm a little bit fuzzy, so it's hard so, I mean, to say. I don't know. Did, you know, did he recognize my voice and said, I know that voice cool and say, I'm going back to sleep? I don't know. You know what I mean? But it's like a moment, you know what I mean? You're like, was there a recognition there? Was there a. I don't know. <laughs> but it's an interesting experience. Yeah. Uh, Chris. Well, one thing I've always considered, you know, um, when they talk about that in terms of, you know, imprinting on an infant, I always think one of the problems is they don't give enough credit to how quickly we imprint and when we start, where we start imprinting. Um, so, I mean, you could be having experiences already in the womb once, you know, you've built up enough brain uh, fetus, you know, they're already taking in experiences. So by the time they're born, you know, they might already have some, uh, might already have something there. Nothing, I guess, magical in the genes or whatever it is. Some people, you know, inherent to mm -hmm. human nature. But there was already a lot of imprinting before we even thought of, you know, the baby being alive, you know, being on your mm -hmm. or whatever. And yep. going with Matt's example, okay, well, going with just basic nature and nurture, okay, you're holding, you were holding, uh, your son, yeah. you said, um, okay, you were holding it in a way that wasn't causing any pain, might have been causing pleasure, you know, keeping warm, whatever. Just in the millis, even the beginning of the milliseconds of that, you know, you've got, so many imprints of every little thing already being built up just in the short uh, uh, span of time, really. Yep. This is leading very well into what I wanted to mention next, but <laughs> go on um, I'd just say that um, one of the reasons that other animals display more uh, instincts right around the birth period, um, for like horses when they're born, they can like walk the first day, like they already know all these things. Um, one of the reasons is because other animals are more, it's called precocial, which means they develop for a longer period of time in the womb before they're born, whereas humans are altricial because our pelvises are so narrow that the, the baby has to be born earlier. So we're actually not as developed as other animals. So these, these imprinted uh, traits actually haven't had time to even form yet, for the most part, when human beings are born. We're still we're still almost uh, like neonatal in what we're born, compared to like other, uh, even chimpanzees have like, wider pelvises than us, so even they don't show the same things as we do. We're very early born, so we, yeah. we have less, less ability to <coughs> because of Yeah, there's a documentary on that. It's kind of like a little barrier. Chris, you want? It's not enough to add, but it's just interesting. I haven't read this article yet, I just printed it out, but the title was literally something like um, imprinting robots, <coughs> right. something along those lines, but I haven't even, Sorry, I wish I would have read it. The title was it, it. I don't remember the exact title, but something like imprinting for newborn robots. Oh, okay. So I wish I would have read it for this class. Yeah. yeah I mean, look it up. Well, we didn't know we were going to go <laughs> and it. it was just that phrase. Could um, we put a robot through a simulated bird of some kind? Yeah. Well, the, there was a news article about that. Yeah. Was it a news article? Yeah. It was actually an article I printed out for the database. Yeah, I feel like I I just have a, I didn't some Italian it. researchers are doing something about birthing robots. I can't remember what. I'll have to look it up. I've got a. Didn't you link to it? Yeah. Hmm? You put it in the general discussion. I put it in the general discussion. Yeah, but I think it was more like it took, it took nine months to make it. Yeah, it took nine months. Yeah. So, yeah, I can vaguely remember it. It was one of many I read at the time. Um, the next. Uh, so, 
He talks about another computer scientist who was on this video, this documentary watched, who was trying to build a humanoid robot. And this particular bit made me think of our discussion of Stella. Because this computer scientist was saying having a body is an important part of human consciousness. So we're back to this idea of sensory again, body, stellar, kind of discussion of that. <clears throat> he hoped to create, create a robot comparable to a human baby, optimistic about the whole thing. And then later kind of said he hadn't done it. And paraphrased, he hadn't found the right algorithms or equations. And he's quite skeptical about that, which he does. Compile any down to say, no, just need to find the right algorithm. It's a very, not a very sensible thing to say as well. What does it omit? Uh, if it's not just all, if, if, what more would he need, this computer scientist who wants to uh, uh, model, let's just say? Nothing, nothing is broken down to one or two equations. You know, these are big, complex systems, right. mixes of hardware and software algorithms. Algorithms, learning, you know, learning time over over time to learn if it's a neural system. Um, the data it's learning from, you know, accurate data, so the inputs, you know, all these things are, have to be right, I guess. So that made me think of Stella a little bit. Um, basically, the last kind of thing I just wanted to mention was the which I think Brian is, and Aaron is more the bit you were talking about. He talks about Watson, the Jeopardy winning machine. And it's very much to, to Richard, a computer is ones and zeros. It's processing, it's writing code and rules. And as you said in your email, there's nothing about it. He actually, he actually says somewhere, um, computers don't learn in the article, which is wrong. Neural networks learn. It's a learning algorithm. So, you know, I, I find I find this was more that he didn't understand the kind of bottom up approach to computing, or had never heard of it. You know, would you agree with that? Your interpretation? Yeah, either he's never heard of it, or he's ignoring it in order yeah. to make his point sound more. Uh, yeah. Kind of support. What, what would be the fundamental thing if you had to say to him in a sentence or two? Um, what What are you indicating when you say? We talked about it, but it's been many weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a bottom-up approach. So, what is it that uh, you're saying when you say a bottom-up approach? A computer, computer system that isn't programmed. Pardon? A computer system that isn't programmed that learns through experience and develops its own knowledge, heuristics, rules, connections. If you want to call them that, um, builds its own memory, builds its own. Weighted connections. So, are the things that uh, a, a machine that is is a, or a system that's moving in a bottom-up way is are, are those things just refinements of rules, or or is there something about uh, machine learning that at some point is no longer merely rule-based? Is that is that, is that quite anyone clear? else want to answer that? Because if, because I think Richard's argument would require that you make that case in order in order to refute his, his particular position, if, if I'm understanding right. Is that making some sense? And I, I'm tired, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I, yeah. I, just, I would just want to say that I would go even deeper than uh, what Damien said and say that you could, you could go as deep as self, uh, self-organization itself, um, where evolution is a self-organizing uh, process. And it's, all it takes is the um, multiple permutations with uh, random variation. It doesn't even have to be random variation. It just has to be variation of some kind to choose from. Uh, mm -hmm. Some selection pressure, and then move on to the next level and the next step, and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. That's all it takes to create something that wasn't there before. And you can use this, and it's, it's basically the same thing that, that semantic networks do. They do something, they find out if it worked or not. They find what worked, what didn't. They keep the stuff that worked, and then they add <coughs> it, and they do it again, and then do it again, and they do it again. So it's the self-organization self -organization itself uh, as a basic concept is responsible for not just genetic evolution, but it's responsible for mimetic evolution, it's responsible for cosmological evolution and, and chemical evolution.
just all these things that boil down to the same process that always creates something more complex out of very simple interactions over a period of time. So could we, could we just that's great, that's a really great thing. Could we could we just scroll back up to the paragraph where he says what is a machine? I think it's just a paragraph or two of, uh, first of all, yeah, there it is. First of all, what is a machine? And then he says, according to Turing, I believe it is a, a rule following device. Mm -hmm. So is a bottom-up approach to computing uh, it, it, uh, a rule following device um, in, in this sense? Your answer, I think, is addressing that. But I, I'm, I'm just imagining what, what Richard might say. Uh, he might say, well, you, so you have the interaction on all these different rules. Right? Mm -hmm. At some point, there is the possibility that um, as these rules interact, that something like novelty will occur. Uh, so, so I'm just wondering if this part of the argument uh, might have a little bit more weight to it than his use of, uh, of Horns and Hitler. Uh, but can you, know, can you help me with Aaron with that? Uh, yeah, I'm saying that the rules can be, it's uh, self-organization in, in this sense especially is a uh, perturbative method. It would, it would make a guess. It, you know, it wouldn't be a, a top-down guess. It would be a bottom-up guess. It would make it would have a random, random uh, assortment in the beginning. It would be wrong, but it would something about it would be right, and that's what would move on to that cell. And then it would be wrong again, but not as wrong. And so it would it would continually uh, approximate a not the perfect solution, like we said with genetic evolution. It's not a perfect optimal solution. It's just a sufficient. And it would it would constantly move towards that uh, based on the selection pressures. So whatever those selection pressures are, they're going to push it towards uh, approximating the rule that satisfies satisfies those pressures. Um, and it's going to be, get to the point where it's sufficient to keep going. And it might stop there. It might you might have some kind of uh, drift past that point where it actually becomes more optimal than it has to be. But um, yeah, that's, that's okay. basically okay. how it would happen. Um, we'll come back to it, but I know Anthony's been wrong, but try to do it. <coughs> so you said that at some point he says in this article that um, he doesn't think computers have a brain? Yeah, we're going to have to find that, right? Because that got me to think, and this is kind of maybe a little uh, one-off or contrary to what I, I usually express. But um, so if you're using the word learn, um, when somebody learns something, they're they're aware that they learned something. They're aware of that knowledge. So, um, I forget what it's called. It's like second order knowledge. When you know that you know something. Intentional. Uh, I don't know about that. Method. Kind of a method. Yeah. When you can reflect. Reflect on, yeah. on something that you've gained, and so neural nets can surely um, learn something in that sense, but they can't. They don't know that they know something. If it's known at all, you just have another net above that one that does that. Yeah, and so that's what, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then what you do is you, you have a net, and then you have a net above that, and one above that, and at some point there they have to is curve a reflection around. net. Yeah. <coughs> this is the part he says that this one, this just jarred it completely against me. Computers are examples of complexion complexity and novelty, but they themselves cannot respond to novelty. So what that is saying is if a computer encounters something it hasn't seen before, it won't be able to deal with it, which is blatantly wrong. You know, look at the internet for robots, so it, it can have, you know, can teach robots from the web about things they haven't seen. And the very fundamental idea of a neural network is that the network gains the ability to generalize. It learns these heuristic rules that allow it to cope with unfamiliar material. That's the whole point of neural networks. They can't learn from experience without following the pre-programmed rule. Yes, they do. A neural network is shown examples and learns from that experience. So this was the bit that I right. really disagreed with him in. Sure, so. Right, and what I, what I think, based on your comment and Aaron's comment, uh, is that uh, this? Is, what I think you're noticing here is that the conclusion that he's drawing in that paragraph does not seem to follow from his earlier description of computers as a rule of following. Mm -hmm. 
uh, machines. So, uh, so there's something about the, uh, the insights to in the, that are given to us by evolutionary computing and by evolutionary theory more generally that, that gives us some insight into the nature of rules themselves uh, and what Richard is calling rules and conventions. So where, where we seem to be disagreeing, where there seems to be room for further exploration of the conversation that we'd be having with Richard and other people who hold positions like his, is in our understanding of how does uh, how, how do simple rules increase in complexity uh, as they interact with other simple rules? And then how do those more complex ruling, rule systems, uh, 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 through perhaps just chance, uh, c come around to something like novelty? Is that making, is that making some? That's a complex that's question. Way of, of formulating because of the novel. question of novelty. Novelty is a difficult one because novelty implies creativity as well in some way. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's a slightly different thing. For example, a neural net encountering something it hasn't seen before is one thing, and knowing how to deal with that. If it's a pattern recognition system, a face recognition system, and it sees faces it hasn't seen before, um, the way we cope with that as humans as well. Um, but creativity being able to paint a human face or to paint an abstract human face or come up with a cubist representation. Something more, that, that's a difficult question. Okay, Richard, you were... Uh, I've been thinking about some of this stuff and uh, it seems to me that uh, I'm still not sure about uh, uh, whether uh, um, uh, whether that um, the computer can ever be uh, similar to a human, uh, but I do know that, that um, or I believe this, that, that uh, if one wanted to try to um, make a computer uh, more human-like. They would have to, uh, uh, it, uh, the person doing this, or the people doing this, would have to talk, uh, or it would have to tell the computer about death. Uh, because uh, death is a very, very important part of our lives. We all know that all people, well, anybody of some maturity, knows that uh, we will die. And this uh, is a terrific influence on how we think. And so, um, uh, uh, therefore, uh, things like death and a few other things that are uh, very important in our lives would have to be uh, communicated to the computer. Uh, and uh, this is a big problem, but I think that it could be, uh, could, could be uh, dealt with. I think um, you've already discussed that with, I've forgotten which time period it was when human, being human was defined by mortality. Yeah, uh, pre-Aristotelian. Pre-Aristotelian. Pre, pre, uh, uh, Pre-Socratic. Pre Pre-Socratic, so there, there was that initial definition. Uh, this has been something that's cropped up over and over again. There are uh, uh, George Bataille, the French writer and philosopher, said, uh, it's one of my favorite quotes, he said, there are three things that we as humans cannot look directly at. One, the sun. Two, death. Three, genitals. <laughs> it always makes me smile at one. <laughs> Ty also said, my, one of my favorite uh, quotations from Ty is uh, eroticism, or what gets translated as eroticism. Is, uh, eroticism is a solitary activity. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful thinker, uh, and, and really was very interested in uh, breaking taboos in our thinking. Uh, 
So, so, so he, he's sort of accomplishing in his thinking the kind of thing that Dennett is asking us to do. We have to, we have to lose a certain kind of reverence for life if we're going to uh, advance in our understanding of it. That, that, uh, but, but we have these prohibitions that we have to be willing at least to violate in terms of our thought experience. And our if we want to develop and move on, we have right. to bring right. the traditional way of which is what we're trying to talk about in this course. We have to break the traditional ways of thinking about being human if we're going to develop these kind of technologies. But I wrote a number of, like Sartre, he wrote novels that were philosophical novels. Mm -hmm. but, you know, so they are stories, but they're kind of quite thoughtful. Um, right, well, any more comments and questions on this before we move on? Philip? I have one. It's not really an answerable question. Because when, when Richard was talking about how a computer to one of the necessary qualities for a computer to have human like consciousness would be to understand death, then the flip side of that would be to hopefully on this, this list one day, if I can upload my consciousness into a net mm -hmm. and live forever, am I then no longer human? Is that then is death necessarily a quality that's required? If I can figure out a way for my conscience to exist forever, but I can't lose my hand. Well, that's Dennett's Dennett zombie paradox is almost exactly this. So if we were to do the neuron replacement in your brain, um, one, then ten, then a hundred, then a thousand, we would have the same brain with the same memories, an electronic version. And this is the philosophical thought experiment that it throws out. Is that still you? If we take that out of your head, you know, and store it, do you live forever? Uh, and this is a f fundamental question we've been asking. It, is that what you, what you are? Or is it more? Help me to understand the example here, though. Because let's, let's say uh, we don't really have to choose. So let's say it's possible for me to uh, upload our consciousness. I suppose by that we mean our own awareness, our memories, yeah. our, our thoughts. Um, I have a problem with this because we still haven't defined consciousness. So. Right, whatever. But, <laughs> I, I, I'm all right with, with the, I think we need to be quite specific about are we dumping our brain activity, which I know we've got this separation of the yeah. object and the the sense of self and the, mm -hmm. the brain. But we could take the neural <laughs> weightings in our brain, <clears throat> recreate that, is that me? And this is the big question that we don't know. Would that recreate me? And for, you to, for yeah. Patrick to say, oh, we download our consciousness, is that what we're downloading or is it something else? Right, whatever it is that we're doing. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, my question is, I don't think I necessarily want to lose my humanity my humanity will play out as my life plays out, right? And it will die. Right? And whatever gets uploaded, whatever it is, these neural waves mm -hmm. or something, uh, that will have its own kind of autonomy. It'll be dependent upon the server and whatever maintenance is required to maintain the server and things like that, but it will be different. It won't be me, right? It will have been some aspect of me. But it may not be the kind of thing that we could limit to saying it persists as me. It will never be anything that can persist as me. It will just be, uh, let's, let's say I make something, or uh, an artist, an artist makes a, a ceramic, a beautiful ceramic work of art, right? So in some ways it's been the, these thoughts, these feelings, these emotions, this act of creativity has been uploaded, or is it downloaded? It's uploaded, you upload this, whatever the language is, right? It's uploaded into the work of art. But 